Ah, princesses, symbols of young royalty. Unfortunately, in a lot of games, stories and other pieces of media, they're usually relegated to one-dimensional damsel in distress roles. But sometimes we get the chance to see them be more than that, protecting their kingdom and people, and being strong independent characters while doing so. That's what I like to see. That got me thinking. What games out there allow you to control princesses? Well, I've noted down a bunch of them, and I put this together. Welcome to Gist List, a series where we talk about games that follow a certain theme or criteria. The theme for this video is... Games where you play as princesses, though I might have bent the rule a bit for some of these. In this first section, we'll go over some Super Mario games. Because Peach is probably the most iconic video game princess to date, it only makes sense, right? Even though she's often getting kidnapped in most games, there are some titles where we actually get to play as her. I'll also bring up Princess Daisy when necessary, and I guess we can throw in Rosalina too. Even though she's technically not a princess, she's more cosmic deity than royalty. But everyone groups these three together, so why not? Plus, in every game where she's playable, Princess Toastal is as well. Anywho, let's start with Peach's first playable appearance in Super Mario Bros. 2, USA, not the Lost Levels. Although for footage purposes, I'll be looking at the best version of the game, Super Mario Advance. This title is often referred to as the Black Sheep in the classic Super Mario Bros. series. There's no enemy stomping or power-ups to grab, apart from these mushrooms found in subspace which extend your health, and stars you can collect after getting 5 cherries. Just lots of stuff you can pick up and throw. The game has 4 different playable characters. They all mostly play the same, just with slightly different strengths in certain areas. One of which being Peach. At first, it might seem like she's the worst of the 4 characters, as she moves and picks up things the slowest, and it's definitely noticeable in those areas filled with sand. But Princess Toastal makes up for that with her mid-air hover, which is very useful for tight platforming segments. And picking up things the slowest can actually be a blessing in disguise. You're invisible while doing so, and you could take advantage of that in certain areas in boss fights. Despite her lack of speed, Peach might actually be my favourite character to play as in this game, although Luigi is a close second. Not my favourite classic Super Mario Bros. title, but it's still cool to go back to knowing that this is Peach's first playable appearance, even if the events of this game take place in the dream world. Next, let's look at Peach's appearance in Super Mario RPG The Legend of the Seven Stars, the 1996 original for SNES and the remake for the Nintendo Switch that just came out recently. Like the name suggests, this was the first ever Super Mario role-playing game, paving the way for the Paper Mario in Mario Luigi series. The story starts off like your usual Mario fair, Bowser kidnapping Peach and Mario setting off to rescue her, but then a giant sword crashes into Bowser's castle, scattering the three in different locations, and strange monsters have been popping up all over the Mushroom Kingdom ever since. And it's up to Mario and his friends, uh, Bowser notwithstanding, he just wants his castle back, to save the day. This title sort of plays like a simplified version of Squaresoft's RPGs of the time, only with time button pressing to deal more damage when attacking, or reduce damage taken, and a tad bit of platforming and Mario segments in the overworld. There's also a few action sequences, short minigames required for progression where you can earn some useful items if you perform well. But back to the subject matter, Peach is the last character to join your party, and is essentially the group's white mage, learning a lot of healing and support moves. She also has a move where she tosses a bunch of bombs? Hmm, reminds me of that one scene from that Mario comic. I usually always have her in my party when she's been obtained, as her recovery ability surpassed that of Mallow's. It's also really funny seeing her slap the silly out of enemies. Fun fact, I believe this was the first game where Peach has a parasol. Neato! Oh yeah, you can also find her unmentionables in her room. Just thought I'd bring that up. Not my favourite Mario role-playing game, but I definitely have a lot of respect for it. It's also unique in the fact that no other one plays like this. Perhaps that's why everyone keeps asking Square for a direct sequel to it. And this remake is fabulous! It has a couple of new things, such as perfectly timed action commands doing extra damage, and a gauge that slowly fills up as you perform successful timed hits. And when it's full, you can either give yourself a random buff, or perform a triple character move that's slightly different depending on what other two characters Mario has in his party. Some might say these changes make it much easier, and kind of removes the game's original challenge, but most Mario RPGs are meant to be beginner friendly to the genre anyway, so I don't see it as a problem personally. And thankfully most of the dialogue has gone mostly untouched. I really wish they kept that Bruce Lee reference though. I absolutely adored the updated visuals in this remake. 
Apart from some frame dips here and there, everything looks clean, crisp, but there's a whole new layer of charm, especially the character introduction cutscenes. These graphics sort of have a toy box diorama feel to them, and I love how they kept everyone's chibi proportions. Everyone looks so petite and adorable. This is actually going to make returning to the original 1996 version very difficult now. How about we look at Peach's obscure playable appearance in the Game & Watch Gallery series? If you've never heard of these titles, they're essentially remakes of classic Game & Watch games with Mario characters. In the modern version of Chef in Game & Watch Gallery 2 and 4, you play as Peach as she cooks food for some Yoshis, think that she's taking the helm for this one, and it's been shown many times throughout this series that Peach is a really good cook, especially when it comes to baking cakes. All you need to do in this game is keep the food Mario and Luigi are tossing towards you in the air by positioning yourself and rotating accordingly. Once the food is cooked, you can feed it to the Yoshi that's always right behind you. Feed them enough and they'll eventually lay an egg and give birth to a baby Yoshi and you'll earn some bonus points. But be careful not to feed it any undercooked or burnt food, the Yoshi will die great if you do that. It's a fun little remake of a classic Game Watch title, and I'm glad they put it back with a new coat of paint in the advanced game. Honestly, I think this series is very underrated, so check these games out if you have the opportunity. Oh, hey Mr. Game & Watch. By the by, I was also made aware that a Peach LCD Game Watch figure exists called Princess Toadstool's Castle Run. Apparently it was a McDonald's Happy Meal toy from the early 90s. Um, I can't say much about it, I don't own one. But now you know it exists! Now, let's talk about, quite arguably, Peach's most iconic playable appearance. The first time she was the star of her own game, I least want to count that Castle Run thingy, which I don't, Super Princess Peach for the Nintendo DS, released in 2006. The plot for this game is pretty... interesting. After acquiring the legendary Vibe Scepter, Bowser uses its power to assist him in his usual kidnapping stick. But after discussing it with his minions, he decides on capturing the Mario Brothers along with a bunch of toads, thinking the kingdom won't be able to do much with them gone taking them to his castle on Vibe Island, the home of the Vibe Scepter. Because Bowser is now in possession of this field-altering baton, almost everyone's emotions on the island and the Mushroom Kingdom have gone into disarray. So it's now up to the princess and a magic talking parasol Toadsworth gave her called Perry to defeat the forces of Bowser, save all the Toads, Mario and Luigi, and return the Vibe Scepter to restore everyone's emotional balance. There's also some flashbacks about Perry's backstory after clearing each world, which is pretty interesting. Super Princess Peach is yet another 2D platformer, however it doesn't play like a traditional Mario game for the most part. You can jump on enemies, but only doing so will knock them prone. Like this, you can pick them up with Perry and either toss them at other enemies, or have Perry consume them for 5 energy. And there's a massive variety of enemies here, like Goobers, Koopa Troopers, Piranha Plants, and... Hang on, is that Starfy? You may also come across enemies with emotions that act differently from the status quo, like sad goobers who run all over the place crying, or mad boos which act the opposite of normal boos. You can collect coins, but these aren't for gaining extra lives, this game doesn't even have lives. Instead, they can be spent at a shop where you can purchase new moves, upgrades, and other stuff. But it is weird how floating is an ability Peach has to buy here. I thought she could do that naturally. The main gimmick of Super Princess Peach are the vibes, which allows you to influence Peach's emotions by touching one of the four hearts on the bottom screen. Joy allows you to fly and create cyclones to blow figures away while descending, but there are some areas where it won't work, so you can't use it to cheese every platforming segment. Rage surrounds Peach with flames, which can hurt enemies, light dark areas, and burn things. It also makes her much heavier. Gloom turns on Peach's waterworks. Her tears can be used to grow plants and put out flames. She also moves the fastest in this one, which you can take advantage of in some segments. And Calm just slowly restores your health, nothing complicated with that one. The Fives had an interesting twist in the gameplay, they kind of remind you of the transformations in the Wireland series, or you could activate these ones at will temporarily. Hidden in each area are three toads, there are also tracks you could collect for the sound tests, and you could also find these jigsaw pieces, which you could complete after finding them all. They're harmless distractions. But the finished pictures are so adorable to look at. There's also free mini games you can play to earn some coins. Toad Jump, an auto runner where you blow into the microphone to avoid enemies. Toad Toad, a game where you navigate a toad through a fire maze using the touchscreen. And Toad Shot, a shooting gallery of sorts also played using the touchscreen. Again, all harmless distractions. I usually play them when I'm a few coins short on something on the shop. Overall, Super Princess Peach is a cute and fun time. 
Even though it's very much on the easy side, I've heard it was made by the same team who worked on the Starfy games, which are also pretty easy, so I guess that's why this title is the way it is. But just because the game isn't all challenging doesn't mean it can't be enjoyable, and I feel like a lot of people knock on this title for that reason alone. I'd rather play an easy game that's fun to play than a frustrating game that's hard to get into. And trust me, we'll get to that in a bit. I've also heard strange complaints from people that this game is... Oh, what's the word? Sexist? <laughs> I mean, you're playing as a woman and the central gimmick is to control her emotions. I don't think it's misogynistic personally, this game is too cute for that. But I can see why others do. I recall people having similar issues to that one character in Ace Attorney. Let's talk Paper Mario for a moment. In these games, like other Mario titles, she's usually played the role of Dazzle in Distress, or the rare instance brainwashed by the main antagonist. But there are some brief segments where you get to control her in 64 and Thousand Year Door, which are interesting. Also, can't wait for that remake to come out. But the game I really want to talk about is Super Paper Mario on the Nintendo Wii. The plot for this one is absolutely insane. A mastermind by the name of Count Black forces a marriage between Bowser and Peach to create something called the Chaos Heart. Now an expanding its dimensional hole to the void has appeared in Flipside and all of its dimensions are in peril unless four heroes of legend collect the pure hearts of each dimension to stop it. That's the story in simple terms anyway. It actually goes a lot deeper than that, but I wouldn't want to ruin the surprises. Super Paper Mario isn't exactly a role-playing game like most titles in this series. It's an action RPG platformer of sorts, where points make you level up. I thought that was an interesting way to handle the experience. The game has four main playable characters, each with different abilities you need to utilize to make progress. One of which is Peach, who you unlocked at the start of Chapter 2, but has the ability to float in midair for a bit with her parasol. There aren't any partners in this game, instead you get these little guys called Pixels, who each have an ability of their own and function very similarly. And again, its story is fantastic. There are a lot of dialogue and moments that made me laugh out loud. I mean, there's even a part where this neckbeard Camilla named Francis gets into a dating sim with Peach and you have to choose her responses? <laughs> what is this? Super Paper Mario is certainly a very unique game. It isn't perfect though. Some levels can get a bit on the monotonous side, like the one where you accidentally break an expensive vase and you have to do a bunch of mundane tasks to gather a bunch of rubies to pay for it. And a lot of the boss fights are very easy. Even easier if you take the one with Bowser, but I'd be lying if I said I didn't have a lot of fun with this title. I highly recommend it if you're looking for a 2D Mario game that's very different from the norm. Also while getting footage, I found out I have one of the early PAL copies with the chapter 2 dude bug that crashes your entire Wii. Fun. I want to give a brief mention to New Super Mario Bros. U Deluxe. Ugh, four years late and I still hate that name. I don't think this game needs much of an introduction, it's mostly standard 2D Mario fare, with flying squirrels and a nabbit here and there. But I wanted to bring it up because when playing as Toadette, the easy mode character for this port, you can find a power up only she can use called the Super Crown, which transforms Toadette into a Peach lookalike called Peachette. Peachette functions very similar to the flying squirrel suit, allowing the former Fungi to float in midair and perform a double jump. This isn't technically playing as Peach, it's still Toadette and I don't think she's a princess, but again, I wanted to give it a mention. I think I recall reading something about the developers wanting Peach to be playable in New Soup Wii, but I had complications along the way so the idea was axed. So it's cool to see that idea come to fruition in some form. Super Crown, Super Crown. Wait, was the that the parent responsible for starting the whole Bowsette thing? Uh, let's not open that kind of worms there, Bear. <laughs> Oh jeez. Even with a sort of playable Peach and being the best new Super Mario Bros. game in my opinion, this title is just... good. Not great, just good. I can only recommend it if you can find the game for a knockdown price or something, especially when Super Mario Bros. Wonder exists for the same price tag and it's a much better game. This isn't even my copy of it! I borrowed it from someone else just to get footage! Now let's get some real Peach action in Super Mario 3D World. The story for this one is simple stuff. Bowser is kidnapped the seven Sprigty princesses. Aw, they seem cute. What game are they playable Oh. So Mario, Luigi, Toad and Peach head off to save them. This title, like its predecessor 3D Land, is a 3D Mario game that plays more like a 2D Mario game, with blocks to bash, power-ups to grab, and every level ending with a flagpole. Very similar to Super Mario Bros. 2 USA, there are four characters you can play as, each with slightly different abilities. There's also a fifth one you could unlock, but we'll get to her in a bit. 
And yet again, one of the playable characters is Peach, who is the source of the main four, but has a bit air hover, just like in Super Mario Bros. 2. She's my go to character in this game since her hover makes her incredibly useful for platforming, and being slow doesn't feel like much of a hindrance in this game, especially with the speed increase this Switch version gave to all the characters. Now let's talk to that fifth unlockable character. After finishing the main 8 worlds, you'll get access to the Star World, and after finishing the second level there, you'll be able to play as Rosalina, who's even slower than Peach, but has a speed move that could be used as a double jump, though you won't be able to use it with certain power ups. It's actually incredibly useful in boss fights. I know some people find 3D World to be a bit on the forgettable side, but I personally find it to be really creative and fun, especially because of all the different level gimmicks it throws at you to change things up, like the ones with the blocks that change in time with the music, or that one level that was a homage to Mario Kart, or the one with the cherries which make clothes of you. There's so many I can name off the top of my head. I had a really great time with this game, and playing for the Switch version last year while mostly using Peach, might have actually inspired me to make this video. Plus, if you're into more collector for Mario experience, this Switch version also includes a side attraction called Bowser's Fury. You could only play as Mario with this, sadly, but the structure here is a bit similar to the likes of Super Mario 64 and Odyssey if that's what you're looking for. How about we move on to the not so new Super Mario Run for mobile devices? Despite reusing a lot of assets from those titles, this phone game plays quite differently from most other 2D Mario games. The main draw that this one is an auto runner. All you really need to do is tap the screen to jump, as your character never stops moving unless you're standing on certain platforms. They also fall to the enemies and grab ledges in this, which is a little surreal to see in all honesty. The game has a number of different playable characters which you unlock by meeting certain conditions, and most of them have their own ability to distinguish themselves. After finishing the main stages and rescuing Peach, you could actually play as her and has a trademark ability to hover in midair. And here's the biggest surprise of all. After getting to a certain point in the Remix 10 stages, you unlock Daisy. Daisy playable in a 2D Mario game? This is awesome! I know it's not a proper 2D Mario title, but uh, we'll cross that bridge in a bit. Daisy's ability here is a double jump. It might not sound like much, but it's insanely useful in my experience, and she's my go-to character in this game because of it. That, and it's nice to play as the other Mario princess every once in a while. My favourite mode to play in this game is Toad Rally. You race against an opponent to see who could collect the most coins in a minute to appease a bunch of toads. By performing enough tricks, or whenever you have a star, you'll activate a coin rush and money will start appearing everywhere, from thin air, pipes, and even thrown by the enemies. It's almost like you're playing New Super Mario Bros. 2 in the moment. To be honest, I don't play this game all that often. Most of my phone hours are spent playing Pocket Camp. <laughs> but if a Super Mario Auto Runner sounds like your kind of thing, check it out. I don't think this game is too pricey either, so it won't leave a hole in your wallet. Next, let's take a look at a Mario RPG no one ever seems to talk about, maybe for a good reason. Puzzle Dragon's Super Mario Bros. Edition. I initially wasn't going to cover this one, but I have the game, so why not? This is a puzzle RPG where attacks are performed by matching these coloured orbs. The more matches you make, and the bigger your combo is, the more damage you'll do. There's also type effectiveness you need to account for. It's pretty fun and addicting, just... Not so much this Mario one. I'm sorry, but I really don't like this game. It isn't the gameplay or the Mario coat of paint, that's fine. It's the difficulty I take issue with. The challenge ramps up way too quickly, forcing you to grind for levels and extra lives way too much for my liking. And I absolutely loathe grinding RPGs. They're such unnecessary time sinks. I remember I had to grind my entire party up to level 60 before I could even stand a chance against the final boss. And I heard this game was the one that's the new players in. They definitely dropped the Super Bowl there. Anyway, after finishing the main stages, you can use Peach as a helper, which is neat, but totally not worth the effort. You could also unlock Rosalina if you cleared the tower in Star World 2, which I only did for this video to show her off and only reminded me how much this game gets on my nerves. Um, do me a favor and avoid this game like a poison mushroom. Just play the other game this door pack comes with, Boss of the Dragon Z instead, which I had a much better time with. I know there are some people out there who enjoy really grindy games, but I'm not one of them. Plus, just looking at this tile triggers some bad memories for me, since I was playing for around the time an ex-girlfriend angrily broke up with me on my birthday in 2016, but I'll stop talking before this gets too personal. Um, let's lighten the mood with the two tactical RPGs made by Ubisoft that's also a crossover with their Rabbids series. That's right, next up is Mario Plus Rabbids Kick the Bell and Sparks of Hope, 
Let's go over Kingdom Battle first, released in 2017. It's already six years old? Yeesh. I would try to explain the plot for this one, but it's so nonsensical even I could make sense of it at some point. Just know that some girl who's a big fan of Mario creates a visor that confuses things, Rabbids invade her home, one of them puts it on and causes havoc, and all of them somehow get sent to the Mushroom Kingdom, and reality slowly turns to shambles. Now Mario and the gang need to find the rabbit with the visor, nicknamed Spawny, to return things back to the way they were, fighting their way through corrupt rabbits with the assistance of these blasters. Kick the Bell is a tactical RPG with grid based movement and mostly projectile based attacks. In battle, your party members have three actions, moving, attacking with their primary or secondary weapon, or using one of their two hero skills. You can also attack enemies by starting into them, and give your teammates a boost in the form of a team jump. The win conditions are different depending on each battle. You might have to defeat all the enemies, get to a certain area, escort someone like a toad to a certain area, or defeat the boss. The game has 8 different playable characters. Well, technically there's 10, but you can only use 2 of them in a DLC chapter. One of which being Peach, who unlock near the end of chapter 3. Where one of your teammates becomes unusable due to being frozen by the icicle golem. But here comes the princess descending on her power sword to lend a hand. A primary weapon here is a freaking shotgun! Which has tons of rage, but deals more damage the closer you are to your target. And for a secondary she has... Explosive rubber duckies called grenade ducks? Um, okay, not sure why she has these, but if they work, they work. She can also use two techniques. Royal Gaze, which makes her automatically fire at an enemy if they move in their slide of sight. And Protection, which increases the resistance of projectile based attacks of her and her teammates if they're in rage. It also redirects a bit of the damage teammates take to her. I thought you were a princess, not a paladin. <laughs> oh yeah, her team jump heals around her a bit after landing. Not by much, but it's something. Though, in addition to Peach, we also have a Rabbit counterpart, Rabbit Peach, who happened to start the game alongside Mario and Rabbit Luigi. Isn't that the name of a British YouTuber? Also, she doesn't seem to get along well with the original until the end of the game. Rabbit Peach's primary weapon is a standard blaster, and her secondary is this sentry, which slowly makes its way to a target and then detonates. It also makes a great decoy, as other enemies will try to destroy it before it reaches its destination. Rabbit Peach also has a defensive technique called Shield. This one doesn't increase your resistance as much, or redirect damage, but it also applies to physical attacks. But exclusive to her is a heal technique, which restores 30% of her HP and her teammates if they're in rage. But this game isn't just battles, there's also puzzles to solve in the overworld to get stuff. There's also a skill tree you could use to upgrade each character's attributes. Overall, Kick the Battle is a pretty fun tactical RPG. It can also get pretty challenging at times. I was honestly surprised when the enemy scrubbed the floor with me in a few instances. Ubisoft also did a fantastic job with the visuals. The characters are all very expressive in their animations, and there are a bunch of moments that made me die of laughter, unintentionally or not. But we can't forget about its sequel, Mario Plus Rabbit Sparks of Hope, or as my friend likes to call it, Super Mario Guardians of the Galaxy. Get it? Cause Chris Pratt? Koopas! The story in this one is a lot easier to digest. A mysterious hooded figure known as Cursor has begun spreading her lackeys in dark energy referred to as Dark Mess across the galaxy. So it's up to Mario and his paisanos, along with some new ones, to collect Dark Mess crystals to power up their ship to reach new locations, while stopping Cursor's forces and ridding the galaxy of the messes she's made. This game plays similarly to Kingdom Battle, but there's some differences. Movement is no longer grid based, and attacking now ends that character's turn. Also, battles are a bit more encounter based, though there's still mandatory ones when you reach certain segments. There's also a few changes made to the characters themselves, like all of them having new weapons, but no secondaries, and only having one technique in this one, but I'll mainly focus on the differences between the princess characters here. Peach now uses the Broombrella instead of the boom shot, but it functions the exact same way, has a lot of rage but deals more damage the closer you are to the target and her team jump no longer heals, that ability was given to Rabbit Peach in this one, but her protection technique was given an upgrade, now it prevents all damage for a few hits instead of increasing your team's defense for a few turns. Rabbit Peach also got a few changes in this game, her blast has now been replaced with the Triple Troll, a rocket launcher that fires free shots and attacks from above. It's great for hitting enemies that are hiding behind cover. Her soul technique in this one is heal, which works the same way as it does in Kingdom Battle. Oh yeah, and she actually talks to this one, as soon as the other rabbit characters. It's getting real. But there's another character I wish to shed light on, and that's one of the newcomers, Rabbit Rosalina. 
Her weapon is the Kabuma, this patchwork luba with a cannon in its mouth that fires a barrage of star bits, and her technique is Ed Yudi, which puts all the enemies around her to sleep. I think Rabbit Cranky had an ability similar to that in the first game, but if you're not a fan of the Rabbit, there's always... Wait, Rosalina herself isn't playable here? This game is actually f garbage. A new addition to this title are the titular sparks. These cute rabbit luba hybrids can be equipped to your party members, and each one has a different ability, like giving your attacks elemental properties or other unique benefits. The sparks are probably the reason why each character only has one technique in this game, because these guys are pretty much techniques in of themselves. You can also feed them star bits you've collected to upgrade their abilities. Here's the best change sparks of hope made. There's no party restrictions this time. In Kingdom Battle, Mario always had to be your leader, and you also needed at least one rabbit character as well, which was limiting. But in Sparks of Hope, you can change the party however you see fit. Wanna stick to just the Mario cast? Or only use the rabbits? Maybe a Taco Fest team? <laughs> the choice is all yours. There are optional battles where you're forced to use certain characters, but I'm fine with those, they are optional after all. I actually ended up liking Sparks of Hope a ton. And somehow this game is even more expressive than Kingdom Battle. The charm got turned up to 11 in this title. It's a bit of a shame that it did not sell all that well from what I've heard, so please show this game some love and support if you can. Even if Ubisoft has been up to some shady biz lately. I still really wish Rosalina herself was playable in this, and I know she isn't because of plot reasons, but still. I thought we were going to get that in one of the DLC campaigns, but I guess not. But hey, we did get Rayman playable in the final DLC, which is super cool. I still wish he got to interact with the Mario cast though. Now we come to our second most recently released game, Super Mario Bros. Wonder, the newest 2D Mario game since New Soup U, and Super Mario Run if you want to count that. The story here is Mario and a bunch of characters are visiting a neighboring kingdom called the Flower Kingdom, a land inhabited by talking plants and these peculiar wonder flowers that have the ability to warp reality itself when touched, but then Bowser crashes on visit and manages to get his hands on the Wonder Flower, causing him to fuse with Prince Florian's castle and is now running amok across the kingdom. So now it's up to you and Prince Florian to collect the royal seeds across the world and use their power to stop Bowser from wrecking the entire place. Interesting stuff. Let's start off with the fact this game has a whopping 11 different characters to play as, two of which being Peach and Daisy. Yes, Daisy in a mainline Mario game. This is wonderful. I heard the reason why she was included was because the game's director would frequently find his two daughters fighting over who gets to use Peach in games and wanted to do something to circumvent it. That's pretty hilarious. I actually ended up using the days for most of my playthrough. Again, it's nice to play as the other Mario princess every once in a while. Gameplay wise, Super Mario Bros. 1 feels like a dream, both figuratively and literally. One that has a bunch of level assets, enemies and power-ups that are unique to this title thus far. So even if you've played every Mario game prior to this, there's sure to be something that'll surprise you. Now she's putting on so much weight that from behind she's looking like an elephant. <laughs> the big gimmick of this game is the Wonder Flowers. By touching one, things will change in the level, so be prepared. Pipes might start moving, you might start free falling, or maybe you might be dealing with a change in perspective. Some Wonder Flowers will change you to something else entirely, giving you a new control scheme to adjust to. They're all really simple though. While under their effects, a wonder seed will also appear, usually somewhere near the end of the level, and grabbing that will end the changes to wonder flower made. You'll also get one for finishing a level. These wonder seeds are the main collectible of the game, and similar to the green stars in 3D world, you'll need a certain amount in order to progress to later levels. Wonder also has many different badges you can collect and equip, which all have different benefits, like allowing you to float in midair, perform a double jump, or making the swimming controls way better. There's also some badges which have a trade-off, like the Invisibility Badge, which makes it so that enemies can't spot you but you can't see where you're going, or the Jet Run Badge which makes you run super fast but you can't stop moving. I found Wonders Online functionality to be great as well. How it works is that you will be paired up with 3 other random players who are playing the same level. You might actually want to turn it on during the search party levels, otherwise it's going to be you doing all the guesswork. And if someone dies, you can save them by touching their ghost, or by sitting out a standee that can save them if they touch it. These standees come in many different poses, and you can buy more in a gacha like fashion. Though I swear I got that crashing peach one more than I'm willing to admit. Thankfully, there's a shop in the flower world that allows you to pay extra for ones you don't already have. Show the online makes the game easier, and you can turn it off if you want a standard 2D Mario experience, 
but it all seemed won my heart to see I was actively helping other players finish the stage, and even show them a secret or two. You could even earn these heart points that show how much you've helped other players. Wonder is a great looking and sounding game too. The facial style and animations are unlike anything we've seen from the new Soup games. It's quite a treat for the eyes. The only sour point this title has are its boss fights, which were all a bit underwhelming, except for the final boss which I won't spoil. But overall, Super Mario Bros. Wonder is definitely the best 2D Mario we've gotten in years. From the whimsy and a ton of unique ideas, I'm sure that this is going to be a game that I and many others will go back to frequently and fondly. Finally, Peach, Daisy, Rosalina and maybe a few others have been playable in a countless amount of other Mario Fiddle games and series. I'd love to cover them all, but I don't have time for that, so instead let's just list a bunch shall we? Mario Golf, Mario Tennis, Mario Kart, Mario Party, Mario Strikers, Mario Teacher's Typing, Mario Step Basketball, Mario Sports Mix, Mario Superstar Baseball and its sequel Super Sluggers, Mario Sports Superstars, Mario Sluggers and Olympic Games, Mario Sign of Buffalo Wings, Book to Mario World before it's service ended, Yakuba DS, Fortune Street, Excite Bike Food Food Battle. <sighs> Finally, she appeared alongside Mario Luigi in the GameCube version of two EA games, SSX on Tour and NBA Street V3 and they all look very out of place compared to the realistic Cubans. It's like Dew Talk C before that was even a thing. It also appears that Peach is going to take the role of main character again in a newly announced game, Princess Peach Showtime, where our Martian Kingdom princess finds herself trapped in some sort of stage play, directed by a villain by the name of Grape, and with the assist of the theatre's guardian, Stella, Peach can take on Grape's lackeys and dawn different transformations to take on bigger threats. It looks super fun, I can't wait to get my mitts on it. I don't know why everyone was getting so worked up over that box art change though. But you may have noticed that there is one series I skipped over that I wish to talk about in more detail. The crossover platform fighting series that makes the internet collectively lose their minds, Super Smash Bros. But I'll mainly be looking at the latest game, Smash Ultimate. I'm sure all of you know how to play this, but for the 10% who don't, Smash Bros is a platform fighter. The objective isn't to deplete your opponent's HP, though there is a separate mode for that. Instead, you have to rack up as much damage as you can to them, then smash them out of the stage to earn points to take their stocks. There's even super moves called Final Smashes you can perform, if you destroy a Smash Ball or feel Final Smash Meter, if the Smash Meter and Smash Ball is turned on that is. The game is a little more complicated than that, with grabs, tilts, special moves, smash attacks and whatnot, but this game could be chaotic fun, especially when you're playing with multiple people and you have items turned on. But enough about the mechanics, let's talk about the fighters, because we actually have a fair amount of playable princesses in this game. To start off, we have Peach, who was first playable in Super Smash Bros. Melee. And believe it or not, she's actually one of the best characters in this series according to the tier lists, thanks to her aerial mobility and tons of versatility options with her turnips. And yeah, her turnip down special is a reference to Super Mario Bros. 2, Peach's first playable appearance. She could even hover in mid-air for a bit just like in that game. So if you're not a fan of Peach, you can always play as the Daze instead. In Smash Ultimate, they added Daisy as an Echo Fighter Peach, a clone character essentially. And to my knowledge, these two play exactly the same. I think there used to be a difference with their turnips, but then it was patched out, so much for that. It is weird seeing her with all of Peach's abilities though. I do wish they differentiated her a bit more, like they did with the other Echoes. Next we have Zelda and Sheik, who are also both added in Melee. In that game and in Brawl, the two are interchangeable with the down special because, our Queen of Time spoilers, Sheik is actually Zelda, though I think we already knew that thanks to this series. Though in Smash 4 and Ultimate, these two are now separate characters, which greatly benefited Sheik, Zelda not so much. Yeah, I don't really like playing as the Princess of Hyrule that much in this series. It's cool seeing her moveset utilizing all the magic abilities from Ocarina of Time. But since she's so slow and her moves are mostly projectile based, racking up damage with her is a slog. Zelda's cute in this, don't get me wrong, I just wish she was more fun to play as in this series. Sheik on the other hand, now that's a different story. Most of her moves don't really have an official source since she didn't do much other than teach you some new songs with her harp, so she just kinda has a generic ninja moveset in this series. But that still doesn't change the fact she's fast and a lot of fun to use, so just like in the game where she originates from, they were cooler when they weren't Zelda. Now we have Rosalina and Luma, who joined the roster in Smash 4. Again, technically not a princess, but screw the rules. Rosalina has an interesting playstyle. She fights alongside a Luma that copies all of her moves, so you're essentially playing as two characters at the same time, kinda like with the Ice Climbers. 
And if you know how to use it correctly, these two could be a devastating combination. Here's an interesting one. According to my research, Lucina is a princess? Sorry, I don't know much about Fire Emblem, but here's what I do know. She's an Echo Fighter of Marth, the only difference being that she lacks the tip damage feature Marth has, so any part of her blade has consistent damage. Makes sense that Lucina and Krom would play similar to the Hero King, they are his descendants after all. Apparently, Corrin is also a princess? The female one, the male one is a prince. Uh, I still don't know much about this series apart from the fact the game they originate from, Fire Emblem Fates, is generally disliked among fans of the series. Making Corrin's inclusion as a DLC fight in Smash 4 a bit baffling in retrospect. The best part about their announcement for me was all the Corrin in the house jokes people made. <laughs> But uh, they fight with a chainsaw sword and can turn parts of their body into this dragon thingy. I've heard of saving damsels from dragons, but this one is the dragon. <laughs> and I think that's all the princesses in this game covered. And it's a good thing we were able to talk about how Zelda and Sheik plays in this series. Because next, we're going to be looking at Zelda games we could play as, well, incarnations of Zelda herself. Now, despite this series being called The Legend of Zelda, you're usually playing as a reincarnation of the hero Link in these titles. Now, I say incarnations because for those not in the know, Zelda isn't a singular character like Peach. There's many different versions of her from different time periods and such. Same goes for other characters like Impa and even Tingle. Lord Dump aside, even though there are some titles where you can play as the titular princess, most of the ones where you're able to are either a spin-off or non-canon. It's kind of a shame since she's such an important character to the series. The only canonical game where you could kind of play as Zelda is Spirit Tracks on the DS, where she takes the role of a companion character for Link. This game and its predecessor Phantom Hourglass are Zelda titles controlled mostly with a touchscreen, and microphones sometimes. I know that sounds bad, and admittedly it is in some areas, but it don't take too much adjustment to get used to. Though you won't just be playing as Link in this, because there are some segments where Zelda would accompany him, and you could guide the princess by drawing paths on the touchscreen. Like, there's one segment in the beginning where you have to distract guards as Link and guide Zelda outside the castle. It's almost like an inverse of that stealth section in Ocarina of Time. But for most of the game, she's separated from her body as a spirit. As the main antagonist, Chancellor Cole, gets a vessel with royal blood in order for their master, Maladus, to be revived. And Zelda obviously isn't okay with this and with some convincing, offers to help our hero in whatever way she can. In the Tower of Spirits dungeons, we'll come across these patrolling magic suits of armor called phantoms, which can send Link back to the start of the room once attacking you once. But by collecting these three tears and attacking one in the back, Zelda is able to possess them and can assist Link in certain ways, such as helping him get past spikes and lava, though she will get scared of the occasional rat. Her AI when being asked to come back to you is pretty good for the most part, but I swear there were moments where she kept running into a wall after being called multiple times. Come on, I thought you had the Triforce of Wisdom, not the Triforce of Stupid! Also, be sure not to accidentally hit her too many times with your boomerang, because she will eventually get frustrated and attack you back. Well, excuse me, princess! Because of all this, I've heard many people say that this is the best iteration of Zelda as a character, and I wholeheartedly agree with those statements and her interactions with Link were super adorable. Spirit Tracks isn't exactly what I'd call a great game, but it's certainly one with a lot of charm and heart. The visuals are also very expressive for a DS title, but I can only give it a cautious recommendation personally. There's a good reason why this game and Phantom Hourglass are the only Zelda games that are controlled exclusively with the touch controls. They haven't exactly aged the best in my opinion. The train driving you do in order to traverse the world eventually got on my nerves at some point, with demon trains that wreck you instantly with a mere touch, and don't even get me started on the moments where you're carrying a passenger and have to abide by the rules of the rails or else they'll get annoyed and leave. Oh you didn't toot the horn when the sign said so don't make me throw into the cargo hold! Even with my personal frustrations, if this game looks interesting to you, definitely track it down. Ugh, I can't believe I'm bringing these up, but I also have to look at two of those dreadful CDI games. Zelda The Wand of Gamelon and Zelda's Adventure. The former apparently being the first game where we actually get to play as the titular princess. That's... good to know. Let's start with Zelda The Wand of Gamelon. The story here is that Zelda's father, King Harkinian, sets off to aid Duke Onkled after they're attacked by Ganon's forces. But a whole month goes by and he hasn't been heard from. 
So Zelda sets off to find out what happened to him. I think she sends Link off to help too, but I don't think he does much after saying he can't wait to bomb some of the Dongos. Developed by the now defunct animation Magic, Zelda The Wand of Gamelon is a side-scrolling action-adventure game. Very similar to the Black Sheep of the series, Zelda 2 The Adventure of Link, and just like that game, it's not very good. Even worse actually. The controls are very janky and stiff, which doesn't help at all with some of the incredibly tight jumps you're required to make. You also need to collect a ton of rupees, or rubies as this game calls them, to make sure you have a ton of items at your disposal. Thank goodness we're not giving them to Mimi this time. Lamp oil to light in dark areas, ropes to climb out of reach platforms, and bombs to blow up rocks in the Dongos. And I see a ton, because lamp oil only works for a few seconds, even in areas that are clearly well lit. Plus you need like 10 bombs to destroy one rock in this game. What are they made of, Jasper? The game also has other issues, but I think I've spent enough time with this one. As cool as it is knowing that this is the first game you can play as Zelda, as we already know, the title just isn't very fun to play. I wouldn't say the game is bad, just very flawed. And most of the enjoyment I got out of it was watching its cutscenes. And some of its music was pretty catchy. I really like that world map theme. Let's move on to Zelda's adventure, made by the also defunct Veridis. The story of this one is that Ganon, spelled with three N's, has taken over the land of Tolomac, stole the celestial signs, and captured Link. Now it's up to Princess Zelda, equipped with a magic pendant and wand, to restore the signs, rescue Link, and defeat Ganon. Another reverse damsel in distress, sorry, eh? But this game wishes it was as good as Super Princess Peach. Yeah, this game isn't that great either. It's not horrible, but it definitely has issues. This game plays more like a traditional Zelda game, with an overhead view, and has a lot more in common with the first Legend of Zelda, and that includes all its shortcomings unfortunately, because you probably won't have an idea on where to go or what to do without a guide assisting you. There are some NPCs which give you advice, but most of it is no help. In fact, I remember there being one old lady NPC that asked you to approach them, and then immediately tells you to trust no one, and steals one of your hearts! I suppose you think you're really funny! The controls here are also a bit on the stiff side. I really wish you could move diagonally, but you can't. And attacking enemies with your wand is easier said than done, since it has incredibly short range. There are some magic attacks you could use, but they require rupees for every use, so you have to make sure your pockets are loaded when using them. And the less said about the dungeons in this game, the better. Um... The game has an interesting visual style, using digitized pictures of real life people for all the game's characters and environments. Rumor has it that the company's receptionist was the one who played Zelda in the opening cutscene, and I think that goes to show what kind of budget they were working with here. Overall, this game is just messy and not very fun to play at all. At least some of the voice acting was okay, and what music the game does have is decent. Most of the background noise in this title are just the sounds of nature. I know I've done nothing but complain about these two games, but they're just not that great. You know, I was wondering if I should even cover these CDI titles since they're not proper Zelda games made by Nintendo, but I decided to try them out anyway just for this video. Didn't play these two for more than an hour though. The saddest part is, I've heard these Zelda games in Hotel Mario are actually some of the best titles on the CDI, which sums up the system's quality as a whole if you ask me. But you know what? Despite their copious amounts of issues, they're not the worst things I've ever played. I actually appreciate the effort the developers put into this thing, like the animated cutscenes and the voice acting. I know they're poorly made and people are still poking fun at them to this day, but the performances and cutscenes from Lick the Faces of Evil as Zelda the One of Gamelon have almost become iconic at this point. In fact, as I was playing through this thing and saw the cutscene where the guy says, this is illegal you know, I died of laughter. So you know what, these games aren't the worst. I certainly played them over Barbarian, that's for sure. If you're somehow curious about them, I believe there are some reverse engineered and enhanced PC ports of Zelda the Wand of Gamelon and Link the Faces of Evil. I don't think Zelda's Adventure was given the same treatment, but I've heard there's a fan made demake on the Game Boy you could try. Don't shill out for an actual Philips CDI or one of its handheld balls just to play these, they're super overpriced on the second hand market, especially Zelda's Adventure. Now let's move on before I start quoting lines from these things. Ah, finally back to some good games! The Zelda titles we're going to cover next are two Musou games developed by Koei Tecmo, Hyrule Warriors and Hyrule Warriors Age of Calamity. 
First, let's cover the original Hyrule Warriors, which released in 2014 for the Overlook Wii U. We will remember you. No, we won't. The Switch is a thing. Oh, 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 yeah, you're right. However, the game received an enhanced port on the Switch in 2018 called Hyrule Warriors Definitive Edition, which has all the DLC and additional content that was exclusive to the 3DS version, Hyrule Warriors Legends, has Breath of the Wild costumes for both Link and Zelda, and it also looks a bit nicer and runs a bit better. We'd be fools not to look at this version. Hyrule Warriors is a hack and slash game where you take on hordes of enemies and the occasional boss, using characters from the Zelda series with an assortment of weapons and combos. What, did Tickle just do a Rider Kick? There's a whopping 28 different playable characters in this game, 29 if you count Link's Great Fairy Weapon. And here's the wonderful part, around a quarter of them are princesses! Well, one of them is a weird case, but we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Let's go over each one, shall we? First, we have this game's version of Zelda. Her default weapon is a rapier and light arrows, but she can also fight using the Wind Waker and also a magic rod. One really cool thing here is that you can obtain costumes and adventure mode to make her look like some of the other Zeldas in this series, which is super cool. She also gets an Ilya costume for some odd reason. We also have a playable Sheik, who again is just Zelda in disguise and fights with a harp and a ton of slashes plus ninja moves. Hey, I know you! No you don't. Next we have Ruto, the Zora princess from Ocarina of Time, and she's actually my favourite character to play in this. Her attacks are fast, fluid, and cover a lot of ground. I didn't think she'd end up being my favourite in this, but here we are. Then we have Tetra from Wind Waker. She requires a bit of an explanation. Minor spoilers here, but Tetra is a pirate who later finds out she's actually her timeline Zelda and does become more Zelda-like at one point thanks to Triforce of Wisdom, but then immediately goes back to being a pirate after Ganondorf is defeated because I think she hated it. Uh, good for her. She's also pretty fun to play as here using a Cutlass and Blunderbuss. From Twilight Princess we have Minna, and there's actually two different versions of her in this. One in her imp form which mostly fights alongside a Shadow Wolf Link, and another in her Twilight form which attacks with a mirror along with these blocky fists who have a ton of range. Also from the same game, we have Agatha, that creepy bug collector. She fights with her parasol and can summon massive insects to wreak havoc for a bit. Agatha is also the weird case I was foreshadowing earlier. She lives in a castle and calls herself Princess of the Bug Kingdom, but I don't think she's actual royalty. So should I even be including her? Eh, I'll give her a pass. I mean, we covered Rosalie and her Peach on this list. And finally we have Toon Zelda, which is the one from Spirit Tracks, possessing a phantom. I don't think I use her much in this game personally, but her inclusion is totally justified. Again, I and many others think she's the best incarnation of Zelda as a character. Harold Warriors is quite a lot of fun to play, and I love all the references and fan service to the series as a whole. And by fan service, I'm not talking about Sia's rack. <sighs> this is a Team Ninja title after all. Though as much as I like it, it still has issues. It can get a bit repetitive, though I've heard that's a problem with most Musou games. <laughs> But I also found using items to be a bit of a slog. Some of the tougher enemies and bosses require you to use them to expose their weak points, and slowly switching between them with the D-pad can take some time. And it could actually take a very long time to fully upgrade your characters and unlock stuff, and you already know how I feel about grindy games, but this is one of the few I can tolerate. Also, the game had a tendency to crash at me a lot when I was playing in handheld mode. But despite all these shortcomings, I'd still give Hyrule Warriors a recommendation, if fighting hordes of mooks with a variety of different characters from the Zelda series sounds enjoyable to you in short spurts. But we can't forget about the other Hyrule Warriors game, Age of Calamity released in 2020. This game is an alternate retelling of what happened before the days Calamity Ganon took over Hyrule in Breath of the Wild, which involves time travel, this cute little guardian fella called Terako, and an early bird appears from Pura before everyone starts sipping over her in Tears of the Kingdom. Age of Calamity plays a bit differently from the original Hyrule Warriors, Slow item switching is a thing of the past. Now all you have to do to use an item is hold down a button and press another. Thank you. Just like in Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom, you can perform a flurry rush on an enemy if you dodge their attack at just the right time. You can also wall kick and use a paraglider for some aerial travel in this game. In terms of playable princesses, we only have two this time. One being the Breath of the Wild version of Zelda, who mostly fights using the Sheikah Slate before awakening her true power, and Mifa, the Zora champion, who I actually quite liked using a lot since her playstyle is a bit similar to Ruto's from the last game. There's also segments we have to pilot the Divine Beast for a bit of variety. 
They're a bit on the minor side, but fun. Me being a big Tokusatsu fan, I could appreciate any game that has giant battles. Though I couldn't help but make Star Fox jokes whenever Revali's ones came up. Gameplay and story wise, it's way better than the first game too. There's actual voice acting in his cutscenes for starters, so that's already a plus. And I really enjoyed seeing Zelda's personal struggle to awaken her powers, and then finally doing it here. That cutscene where Urbosa convinces Zelda not to compare herself to Link, being one of my favorites in the entire game, maybe even the entire series. So yeah, Age of Calamity is a fun time. I just wish it had as many different characters and players in the first, and maybe ran at a smoother frame rate. Now we come to our final Zelda game. What really started as a DLC idea for the Switch version of Crypt of the Necrodancer, that ended up becoming its own title, Kings of Hyrule, developed by Brace Yourself Games. The story for this one is that the Kingdom of Hyrule has been taken over by a dark magician named Octavo, basically get rid of the curse upon the land. Now it's up to Link, Zelda and Cadence to defeat his four champions and take him down a peg. Cadence of Hyrule is a grid based rhythm roguelike that plays very similar to the original Crypt of the Necrodancer, but also has Zelda elements thrown in. Everything in time acts with the music, and you have to as well. The better you are at moving in time with the beat without taking damage, the better your rewards and bonuses will be. The biggest difference with this game is that it has an overworld and many different areas to explore. Your main goal is to get through the four dungeons, which aren't traditional Zelda dungeons. They play more like how levels in Crypt and Necrodancer do, with narrow pathways, tons of enemies to defeat, and maybe occasional chest or shop here and there. These dungeons end with a boss fight with one of Octavo's champions, which when defeated will drop a magical instrument, and all four are needed to break the seal in Hyrule Castle and defeat the Dark Magician. I believe you could tackle the dungeons in any order you wish, so the world is kind of your oyster here. Combat is pretty simple, you attack enemies by bumping into them, but beware of the enemy's movements and attack patterns, one wrong move and you'll be taking damage, though if you're using a weapon that has better range such as the broadsword or spear, you might be able to steer out of harm's way. And I know this sounds like a no brainer sort of thing, but try not to die, because if you do you lose all the rupees you are carrying as well as your fragile gear like torches and shovels. You won't lose upgrades though thankfully. Though the game does take you to a sort of pity shop where you could buy some stuff for the diamonds you collected, a secondary currency. The game has multiple different cards you could play as, they all play the same for the most part, but each one has techniques and upgrades only they can use. Zelda being one of two characters you could choose to start story mode in, after finishing the tutorial dungeon as Cadence, the other being Link obviously. But don't worry, you could eventually find the other character you didn't choose sleeping in Kakariko village and use the hibiscus potion to wake them up. What makes Zelda unique from the others is her access to Nehru's love, which counters attacks and reflects projectiles, and Din's fire, a projectile attack you could control and has a huge blast radius, though you have to stay still when using the move. So make sure to activate it when you're in a safe location. Scattered across Hyrule are purple chests that usually contain upgrades for you, Zelda staples such as the boomerang or bow, though some chests require special requirements to be fulfilled before they're open, such as all the enemies on screen need to be defeated. With this game being a roguelike, most of the board's level design is random each playthrough, making each run unique from the last. But you can't enter a specific seed if you want the world to be generated in a certain way. And everything I mentioned was only talking about story mode. There are some other modes you could play like dungeon mode, where there's no overworld and only play through the dungeons, making the game play more like how Crypt of the Necrodancer did, and there's even more modes you could try if you bought the season pass. Speaking of this game's DLC, if you own that, and if you're feeling royal but a little on the edgy side, you could also give the character Shadow Zelda a try, who plays very similar to normal Zelda, but I believe her Din's fire and Nehru's love work a bit differently. Out of all the Zelda games I looked at here, this one was definitely my favourite. I honestly didn't expect to like this one as much as I did, and the soundtrack featuring remixes of many different themes across this series is phenomenal. Definitely give it a listen, and check this game out if you can. And don't worry if the rhythm aspects aren't for you, I believe there's an option to turn all that stuff off, and instead everything moves when you move. The game also has a demo on the eShop if you wish to try it before you buy. You can't play as Zelda in it sadly, but the demo has just enough content to show you what the game is all about if you're on the fence about it. Now that we've covered our final Zelda title, we can move on to some other games in the series. Just a heads up, there's going to be a lot of RPGs. Since we mentioned the Starfeast series while talking about Super Princess Peach, let's talk about those. 3, 4, and the legendary Starfy specifically. These games are a series of marine platformers developed by Tosei. 
again, the company behind Super Princess Peach. What's a marine platformer? Well, that just means there's going to be a lot of swimming and water segments. But don't worry, the swimming controls are really fluid. You can move in any direction while in water and swim faster by holding down the jump button. You can also take out enemies by using Starfy's spin attack, but don't overdo it, you'll get dizzy and won't be able to move after a bit. There's also the occasional transformation section to shake things up. You can also customize them on the pause screen with stuff you've collected throughout the game. There's even a Peach costume with Perry in the fourth game. Makes sense, same devs and all. But that's not why I wanted to mention though. I bring these up because there's actually a playable princess in these games in the form of Starfy's little sister. Starly! No, not that Starly. There you go. Unlike her prince older brother who's compassionate and a bit on the lazy side, Starly is impatient, rude, and is generally just kind of a brat. Despite all this, and not being as strong as Starfy, she's still a force to be reckoned with. In terms of gameplay, Starly plays similar to how Starfy does, but she has a few unique maneuvers of her own. Mainly her ability to crawl through tight spaces and wall jump. And there are segments in Dead Sets with those Star V3 and 4 where you have to switch over to Starly and make use of her unique moveset. They're a nice change of pace, though I think I generally like playing a Star V more. His mighty spin and double jump just make getting around less of a hassle. Though I do prefer Starly's exclusive spill ability over Star V's and Dead Sets with those Star V4, where she gets the puff top barrier which makes Starly temporarily invincible. Whereas Starfy gets the Mighty Spin, which looks cool until you realize you can only use it for like 3 seconds. In the Legendary Starfy, the only game in this series that was localized, she's handled a bit differently. This time she's decided to hold down the fort in Puff Top while Starfy was helping an alien bunny prince named Bunston. So unfortunately you don't get to see her much in this game. Though before certain boss fights and level segments, you could call for Starly's help and play cop with another person through local or download play. I wish you could play the whole game like this, but it's only for select segments. Though Starly does have a moment in the spotlight after finishing the game, because then you get to play a short world which details the events that went down when the terrible trio tried attacking Puff Top. You could also play as her in the boss rush mode, which I guess also counts for something. But I still prefer how she was handled in the previous two games better. I also find it really strange how Starfy has voice clips in this game, but Starly didn't get any at all. Even then, I highly recommend you check these games out. Just like Super Princess Peach, they're very easy overall, but really cute and enjoyable titles. If you have to check one out though, I highly recommend Dead Sensu no Star Free 3. Not only because it's Starly's debut title, but it's also my personal favourite entry in the series. Chock full of fun gameplay and standout moments. Like in World Day, we get a surprise cameo from Mario of all people, and he helps you through the levels using transformations from the Wire Lad series. The entirety of the world is just a big homage to Wireland 4, and I absolutely adore it. And just when you think you finished it since no Starfy 3, the game goes, No, no, no Starfy! To save the world you need crystals! And you go on a second quest where you can now switch to Starly on the fly with the select button, and every world has four new stages to visit in order to collect these evil crystals and face the true final boss. Just keep in mind you also need to revisit the stages where you got the transformations to get the respective upgrades, because some of them are required to access the new levels. Sure the game's text is mostly in Japanese, but the game is simple enough that you don't really need to understand it to make progress and have fun. Give it a try! I also recommend trying the Legendary Star theme, which is actually my second favourite in the series, and the one I definitely think has the best transformation segments. I wish that Mermaid one wasn't cut though, I would have loved to have used that. Let's start with our first non-Mario related RPG, though it can be if you want to because you could put almost anyone in it. That's right, I'm talking about the Mii focused role playing game Miitopia, which originally released on the 3DS in 2017, but I'll be looking at the enhanced port made by Grezzo released in 2021. The story of this game takes place on the titular Isle of Miitopia, an island paradise for Mii characters of all sorts. However, the peace has recently been disturbed by a dark lord who's stealing people's faces and placed them on his army of monsters. You play as a random traveller, or in my case the creator of this channel and these videos, Roshenda, as they get assistance from a mysterious god and an amulet who gives them power in the form of several jobs to fight back against the dark lord's minions, basically the faces of all those that were stolen, and meet several new party members and other colourful characters who you cast yourself. In terms of gameplay, Miitopia is a mostly standard turn based RPG, though you can only choose the actions of your main character. Everyone else acts on their own accord, and I'm not going to sugarcoat it, it can make some really dumb decisions sometimes. I'm looking at you Adriana. 
In addition to gaining experience and leveling up after battles, your characters can also level up their relationships with other party members, which has many benefits like them teaming up for attacks or cheering each other on after successful KOs. But be aware, it's also possible for me to get into quarrels with others, and they can act antagonistic until the resentment is resolved. Metopia has a ton of customization options. Thanks to Switch version's makeup and wig feature, you can put almost anyone into this game, including yours truly. But creating party members, you can choose seven different personality types, which affect how they battle and treat others. Then you have to choose a job for them. You start off with six, but unlock more as you make progress through the game. Each one has different strengths in certain areas, like some being more damage focused and others being more support based. One of the jobs being a princess one, which you unlock when reaching the realm of Fae. Oh, and male can still use it too, interestingly enough. This is a mostly support based job, which uses fans as weapons. Princesses can attack one or multiple enemies with royal waves, lower their defense with perfume, distract them by making them dance, prevent other enemies from getting debuffed by blindfolding them with their fan, restore MP of themselves and others by drinking tea, or get saved by others and evade damage. And its horseplay skill is absolutely ridiculous. Oh yeah, exclusive to the Switch version of Metopia is this horse you and your teammates can occasionally use to perform stronger attacks on enemies. If your main character has a close enough relationship to your mule, they can perform a horseplay move, or horse whispering as it's called in the American version, which uses up all their MP and is different depending on the job they have. Like the jobs themselves, they can either be damage focused or support based. For the princess, it's the latter, and it might just be the most busted one in the entire game. It fully restores your other teammates MP and applies a gleeful stats to them, giving them a slight boost to their stats. And the move also has a chance to lower the enemy's defense, similar to the perfume technique. It essentially turns your other teammates into killing machines. It might as well be labeled the I win button. And I know the flower one gives your teammates the gleeful status as well, but I kind of find that one worse since you could only use it when one of your teammates is low on health, similar to the cleric one. Because of all these things, the princess job is actually one of my favorites to use. It isn't my all time favorite, that honor goes to Popstar, but princess is a close second. Overall, Metopia is a hilarious and charming RPG that's great to newcomers of the genre, though I wouldn't call it amazing or a must play though. I mean, enduring your teammates dumb decisions can only be entertaining for so long. This is probably the reason why the pop star jump is my favourite, since it has a skill called Encore, which essentially allows you to give your turn to one of your party members, putting a little more control in your hand. And just a heads up, during the main story it does a really annoying thing where it takes your party members away and steals the job your main character was using, forcing you to start over from level 1. TWICE! It's honestly gotten to the point where I think I enjoy making memes more than actually playing the game, oddly enough. Oh, and if you want to use me or some of the other characters Rashenda made, here's the access key, go nuts. Oh, and one more thing. This game is Amiibo compatible and allows you to don the costumes of several Nintendo characters. You probably saw Lock and Petch wearing some in my footage earlier. <laughs> I love these two. The coolest thing about them is that they can be equipped no matter what job you have, except for tanks could screw the tanks. So even if you're not using the princess job, you can still look the part at the very least. Let's jump from one previous port to another with Root Factory 4 Special, released in 2020. This is another game that bends the rule of it, and I'll explain why in a moment. You have the choice to play as a male player character whose default name is Lest, and a female player character whose default name is Frey. I'll be using Frey, obviously. The story here is that your character is currently being taken to some place by an airship, but then they're ambushed by bandits, somehow get amnesia, and is accidentally thrown off the ship. They thankfully survived the fall, ended up landing on a dragon. The dragon then introduces herself as Ventus Will, or Venti for short. Soon after, we meet one of Venti's butlers called Vulcanon, who says they've been waiting for a princess to show up, and you could be it, whose name is apparently... Arthur? Confused, your character decides to go along with it, since they don't remember much about themselves other than their name. Eventually, the real Arthur shows up and is told about the mix-up, but he's actually completely fine with it and asks you to take his place as representative to this kingdom, as there are things he wishes to do without his prince responsibilities getting in the way. So yeah, the character you play as isn't technically a princess, but more of an acting princess as Arthur puts it. That's all the opening stuff anyway, the story goes much deeper than that, but I'd be here for a while if I talked about everything, so I'd rather let you all see how it plays out for yourselves. 
Rune Factory 4 Special and other games in the series are spin-offs of the Harvest Moon slash Story of Seasons titles. They're still partially farming sims but also action RPGs. Farming is pretty simple, you plant seeds, water them, cultivate them, and once they're fully grown you can put them in the shipping box for profit. There are many different fruits, vegetables and flowers you can grow in this game. There are even plants that you can grow that can be used as weapons and shields, as well as ones that can be explored in the form of randomised dungeons. With the items you've collected, you can create new things with them by crafting, but in order to get certain crafting stations, you'll need a license, which you get after completing an exam for it, as well as the materials and money needed to make said crafting station. You also learn new recipes by consuming bread, because I guess learning them naturally wouldn't be goofy enough. To take the exam, that's where the royal symbol comes in. After performing good deeds, you'll earn princess points, or prince points if you're playing as Lest. With these, you can perform royal decrees, such as putting new festivals in place, making changes to the shops, or even upgrading your farm. Combat in this game is pretty straightforward and fun. There are many different types of weapons you could use, each having different strengths in certain areas. Your farming tools could also be used as weapons. They're not the best, obviously, but the option is there if you want to. You could also use magic in the form of skills, like special attacks and healing spells. If you have space in your bards, you could tame monsters you could come across by giving them items, and they can provide services such as producing items for you each day, fighting by your side, and if they trust you enough, you could even get them to take care of your farm. Boss bosses could even be tamed too, though they only like very specific items. Don't forget to establish friendships with the townsfolk too. You could increase their trust towards you by talking to them each day, and by giving them gifts as well but try to remember everyone has preferences for what they like and dislike. They also love stuff that was handmade by you, so keep that in mind. If they like you enough, you can even ask them to fight alongside you. And if you're super duper close to someone, you could even confess their love to them and eventually get married and have a child. Isn't that sweet? Overall, Moon Factory 4 is a game I've spent countless hours on. There's so much to do and see, and the game's mechanics can actually get really deep once you look into them and the special version adds even more stuff to do. I love almost everything about this game, its story, characters, gameplay, presentation and dialogue, some of which gave me a really good laugh. This game also holds a special place in my heart, since I first played it in 2016, and hearing all the characters say happy birthday to me really cheered me up after what happened between me and my ex-girlfriend. I highly recommend checking it out. New physical copies of it are actually surprisingly cheap, so if that isn't the reason to give it a try, I don't know what is. Let's talk about Sonic the Hedgehog for a moment, because there's a princess from that series I wish to cover here. <laughs> no, we're not talking about Princess Elise from Sonic 06, I don't even think she's playable in that, apart from the segments where Sonic is carrying her and you can use her energy field or something like that. No, this is the princess I wish to cover, Blaze the Cat, the princess of the Soul Empire and guardian of the Soul Emeralds, her dimensional equivalent of the Chaos Emeralds who first appeared in 2005 Sonic Rush, developed by Dimps for the Nintendo DS, which is the game I'll mainly focus on here, but I'll also mention two other playable appearances Blaze has as well. Sonic Rush for the most part feels like your usual 2D Sonic game where you collect rings and use momentum to try and reach the goal as fast as possible, but this time the gameplay is split across the DS's two screens, which makes it agonizing to edit for this video, but I'll try my best. This game is noticeable for being the first Sonic title to introduce the boost, allowing you to blast off at a high speed by simply pressing the Y button. You can't boost forever, but since we feel like the boost meter is very easy to do, it may as well be unlimited. You can play as two different characters in this, Sonic and Blaze. These two pretty much play the same, but I think Blaze is a little slower but has better aerial mobility. And you do have to play through both of their stories to unlock the final level. The stage order is somewhat different between the two, but the levels themselves are the exact same which does mean you essentially have to play through the game twice and collect all the Chaos Emeralds in Sonic stages to unlock the true final level, but at least it's not 4 times like in Sonic Heroes. And the game has other things I take issue with too, and most of them come in form of the game's level design. A lot of it is filled with do or die moments, especially in the later stages. Failed this type platforming segment? Too bad you just got dipsed! Combined with this game's limited amount of lives, and you've got yourself a game that's not exactly first timer friendly. I wouldn't call this Sonic game one of my favourites, but I'd still recommend it if you're looking for a fast paced platform with an incredibly catchy soundtrack. Just uh, be aware of this game's sucker punches. 
I could also give a cautious recommendation to its sequel, Sonic Rush Adventure. This game is pretty much more of the same, and you don't have to play through it twice to see the final stage thankfully, but the game has other issues. Before each stage, you have to travel to it using one of four vehicles and play a short minigame as you're traveling. There's also the issue of building the vehicles themselves, which requires certain materials you get after finishing stages, and if you don't have enough, you're forced to replay levels until you do. What a way to pad out the game. Blaze is also in Sonic 06, even though they completely record her story in that, saying she's now from the far future instead of an alternate dimension. I've heard Blaze is also one of the most fun characters to play as in this game. I guess even garbage has its silver linings. Ever heard of a game called Guardian Heroes? It's a beat up RPG for the Sega Saturn, where you switch between three planes and defeat enemies of all sorts by doing violent combinations to pull off special moves. It's pretty fun, but not the actual game I want to talk about. That would be its spiritual successor, Code of Princess. So I'm only looking at the original 3DS version and not its EX version on Switch, and I'll get to why in a moment. In this game, you play as a princess in scandalous armor called Selange, and some other colorful characters they try to take on the Distraught army, who's responsible for destroying the royal castle and attacking the kingdom of Deluxia. And Code of Princess plays just like Guardian Heroes, and it's also pretty fun, despite that terrible fate. The original is available at 3DS, though it only received physical copies in Japan and America. So if you live in Europe like me, you're out of luck because it was only available through the 3DS eShop and that's dead now. There is also the EX version which is available on the Switch and Steam, which I've heard is better in some ways but worse in others, such as lacking the English voice acting due to legality issues, and there aren't that many changes that made me want to double dip personally. I've heard Selage is also playable in Blaze Trenches and Crystal Crisis, so check those out if you're looking for more scandalous princess action. How about another Japan only game, My Bread and Butter? This little gem is Princess Crown also for the Sega Saturn, a game that might look familiar to Vanillaware fans. I wasn't sure to include this one because technically you play as a former princess that was just crowned queen called Gradriel, but I think she's still referred to as princess, and the game is called Princess Crown, so... This title is an action RPG of sorts that plays like a fighting game. Every battle is fought one on one with an enemy, but you can't just swing your sword willy nilly, each time you attack, you decrease your power meter, and you can't do much while it's empty, so only strike when necessary. You could also use items to give yourself the upper hand, like food to heal yourself, or potions you could down for a temporary buff. It kind of goes without saying, but this game is gorgeous. The pixel art is vibrant and very well animated. It's an absolute feast for the eyes. This title is totally worth checking out, Though if you do, you'll probably want to get a guide on standby, because as of now, there hasn't been a fully completed translation of Princess Crown in any kind, which is a shame. And I really think this title needs one, because it's quite a bit more complicated than something like Nintendo no Star Fee 3. Also, I wish there were more accessible ways to play it other than emulation. It's been re-released on some PlayStation platforms a few times, but still only in Japan. And I wouldn't recommend looking for a physical copy that's not likely going to work in a few years thanks to disc rot. Plus, have you ever seen the second-hand prices for this thing? They're not pretty! <laughs> Speaking of RPGs and princesses, let's talk about one of my favourite role-playing games of all time, Final Fantasy IX, released in 2000 for the PlayStation. The one many people consider to be the soft reboot of the series, as this title was the one that finally returned back to the fantasy setting. The story for this game is pretty complex, so I'll only go over what happens in the game's opening hours. Sedan and his thieving buddies have prepared a stage play for the Queen, which is actually a ploy for them to kidnap her daughter, Princess Garnet. A couple of things go wrong here and there, such as a knight named Steiner intervening, but they were successful in doing so. Also, a black mage who simply wanted to see the show tags along too. As it turns out, Garnet actually wanted to be kidnapped, because she knows her mother, Queen Braun, has secret plans to wage war upon the continent using an army of black mages. Beings created from mist just like our friend Vivi. And all of these are being supplied by a mysterious man named Kuja, who has secret plans of his own. And yes, that's a guy, I mean, I'm one too despite my feminine looks. And I believe Garnet didn't want to be any part of this, and it seemed like the only option that he had to get away from it all was to run away without the Queen's notice. And also goes under the alias Dagger to keep her true identity a secret. So it's up to our heroes to figure out what's truly going on and stop Kuja's plan, whatever it might be. Again, that's only the basics of it, and I think I might have got a detail here and there wrong, but what really makes this story so great is its charming cast of characters, 
such as the main character's Dan, a thief who wishes to steal Garnet's heart, the overprotective and bumbling knight, Steiner, and the absolute cutie black mage that is known as Vivi. I could go on about them for hours, but when you discuss the game itself. Final Fantasy IX is a turn-based RPG, but it differentiates itself from others by having an active time battle system. How it works is that each party member can only perform an action once their meter is full, same goes for the enemies. So technically the battles are in real time while still being turn-based. Let's talk more about Dagger. She's a white mage and also a summoner, meaning she learns a lot of healing and support moves, but eventually gets the ability to perform powerful summons. These use up a lot of her MP, but deal massive damage to the enemies. Oh yeah, this game also has something called Trance. When a party member takes stuff damage and the meter next to the ATB one is full, they'll enter trance mode for a few turns, which makes their attacks more powerful and allows her to do something extra depending on the party member. In Dagger's case, it allows her summons to have a better chance of playing out their full animations, making them more powerful, and they might reappear to perform more attacks so long as Dagger remains in trance mode. I haven't even gotten to the equipment and abilities yet, and that's a big part of what makes Final Fantasy IX unique. Instead of learning most abilities through leveling up, like in other RPGs, the things your party members can equip will usually come with an ability they can use, and they can be active if they have enough magic stones. And if they collect enough ability points after battles, the ability can be inherited permanently. So using the best weapons and armor for your characters each time isn't the right way to go about things. I mean, you can do that, but they won't learn many new skills that way. But just a heads up, there's a segment in the story where Garnet loses her voice after performing a really powerful summon and becomes a not so competent party member. Sometimes attacks won't work since she can't focus and she can't use trance either. I think that might be one of the reasons Aiko exists. She's another white mage in some of the party member you get. And I think I might like using her more than Garnet since she gets access to that incredible Phoenix summon which deals damage and revives fallen party members. If it wasn't obvious from how much I've been gushing about this game, Final Fantasy IX is an RPG I love very much and I give the highest of recommendations. It's been re-released digitally on many different platforms, so if it's available on one you own, I highly recommend giving it a try. Let's move on from one RPG I adore to another with Chrono Trigger for the Super Nintendo, though I'll be looking at the DS version here cause it's the only one I own. The story is complicated, but here's some bits and pieces of what goes down. It starts off with a teen named Krona waking up and heading to a fair, and while he's there, he meets a mysterious girl called Mal. Or is it Molly? I'm not sure. She's looking for some fun, and the two experience the joys of the fair together. After that, Krona meets up with his friend Luca, a young inventor who's testing out a teleport she just made. However, when Molly uses the teleporter, something goes wrong, thus reacting to her pendant, and she somehow sits through a strange portal. Chrono goes after her and we're sent to a version of the world that's a little different from the one in present day. And we find Marley in the royal castle who everyone there seems to mistake for their queen Leanne. After the two meet up somewhere in private, she comes clean to Chrono. Her real name is Princess Nadia. Marley is a fake name she came up with to hide her true identity. She did all this because she got tired of her royal lifestyle and didn't want to miss out on attending the fair. She lets run the two return to present day However, the castle's guard and chancellor jumped Chrono quickly as they thought he had kidnapped the princess. And after a trial and maybe a jailbreak depending on your actions during the fair, Chrono, Marl and Luca find themselves being chased by the chancellor and the guards yet again. The group find another time gate, which they blindly go through since it's their only chance of escape. The gate ends up taking them to a desolate but technologically advanced version of the world, and later find out this is the far future. And the reason why the world is like this is because a monster named Lavos, who arrived on this planet for a meteorite in the planet's very early years, is going to wipe out most of existence in the year 1999. Yeah, you could tell this is a pretty old game by that. <laughs> so it's up to Chrono, Marl, and Luca to team up with a bunch of other characters, each coming from different time periods, to help them with the dilemmas they're going through in their time, and eventually get strong enough to take out Lavos themselves. That's the story without giving away too much anyway. It's absolutely fantastic and I wouldn't want to rob anyone from experiencing it blind for the first time. Its character moves were also very sweet too. Chrono Trigger has an active type battle system, very similar to the ones in the Final Fantasy games, but it does work a bit differently in this title. Your party members only have three actions they can perform with their turn. Attack with their weapon, use the tech in the form of stronger moves or a support technique like healing, 
or they can use an item. Also timing and enemy positioning is everything. While you're not attacking, the enemies will move around a bit. And each of your attack moves has a certain attack range, so it's best to try to take everyone else out by using as few moves as possible. You also have to be aware of certain enemy stances, because attacking at the wrong time may be to your detriment. Marley fights using a crossbow, but can also use some healing and support techs, and also gets access to ice magic later on. Which is funny, because I believe the box art incorrectly shows her using fire magic, and Luca's the one who gets that. I think it's because this illustration was actually a piece of concept art, or something like that. And here's a cool feature this battle system has. If two of your posse members have their turn active, and if their level is high enough, they can perform a double tech, which are much more effective. Going even further are triple techs, so your characters all have to be at a super high level, and Chrono is required for most of them. Chrono Trigger's battle system is super engaging and fun. I also find it pretty genius that the game's story revolves around time, and so does its gameplay with its battle system. The game's visuals, presentation, and soundtrack are also really impressive for a Super Nintendo title. Please try this game out if you can. I would tell you to get the DS version like I have, with all the extra content and bonus features it added, but it's unfortunately gotten expensive in recent times. And the original cartridge is even worse! I feel lucky I got this game as a Christmas gift in 2015. But I've heard the Steam version is pretty decent. It took several patches to do so anyway. So try going for that one if you don't want to pay exorbitant prices. Our next game is Child of Light, another Ubisoft developed game, and another RPG. This will be the last one, I promise. In this game, you play as Aurora, a young princess who wakes up in a strange land and is trying to figure out where she is and how she can get home. While exploring, you also meet a firefly called Igniculus, who acts as a companion for Aurora, and can be controlled with the right analog stick. By clicking the right stick, he can create light, which can be used to solve puzzles, open certain chests, and blind enemies in the overworld so they won't try to get in a battle with you. But you can only do so for so long, indicated by the meter. But it can be restored quickly by finding plants and collecting these orbs of light. The reason why I wanted to talk about FF9 and Chrono Trigger before this one is because Child of Light also has something similar to the active time battle system, but the one this game has works a bit differently. On the bottom of the screen, you can see when one of your characters or one of the enemies is about to act. When one of your party members reaches the red part of the meter, you can choose their actions, such as performing an attack, using an item, or switching out a party member. The game also pauses when it's your turn. Each action requires a different amount of time to be performed. For example, guarding is instantaneous, but using a strong magic attack may require a good number of seconds to warm up, and you're still in control of Igniculus in battle and you could shine this light on enemies to slow their progression on the meter down. It's also possible to set an enemy back on it, by attacking them while they're preparing an action themselves, but be careful, they could do the same to you. Your character can also equip these gems called Okuli. Depending on what slot they're in, they can give your attacks elemental properties, resistance to certain elements, or other useful benefits. You can also combine it with others to enhance their effects. Every character also has a skill tree, which can dedicate points they get after leveling up to, adding them stat bonuses and new skills. The game also has a beautiful art style. It's like a water painting that's come to life. I've heard this tile actually runs in the same engine as Rayman Oranges and Lemons, and I could most definitely see that here. In the end, Child of Light is a fun little RPG with a gorgeous art style. I think the game goes on sale frequently on digital storefronts, so look into that. Again, even if Ubisoft has been up to some shady business practices. Though it is weird how he looked at three different RPGs that have playable princesses, which all have similar battle systems. Whatever works, I guess. The last few titles I'm going to be talking about here are... Ugh... Licensed games. I'm not exactly looking forward to some of these, so let's start with the best one I have. Are you a fan of One Piece and love Smash Bros? Then you're going to love this title. This here is One Piece Jagger Battle 2 New World, a Japan only One Piece platform fighter released for the DS in 2011. This game has a ton of playable characters, ranging from the Straw Hats and their time skip counterparts to many of the series' villains, one of which being the Princess of Alabaster, Vivi. No, not that Vivi, we're done talking about FF9. There! Why does that keep happening? She fights mainly using her peacock slashes, and her giant duck companion Karu will also join her for some attacks. You can perform a variety of moves by pressing B and holding a direction, even tightly up and down. You can also perform grab attacks on your opponents, and pick up items to chuck at them. 
A weird tidbit about this game is that you can never turn the items off. You can make them appear less frequently, but they can never go away. There goes this game's competitive scene, I guess. You also have assistance in the form of three support characters, which you can summon by tapping the icon on the bottom screen or by pressing a button combination. The supports are also stronger if you use characters that are linked to them, so keep that in mind for team building. The character you're playing as can also perform three special moves if their meter is filled enough. Also, I love how the strongest one shows a short animated clip of the character before they perform the move. I thought that was a nice touch. This game does suffer from a bit of slowdown when you're playing with four people and when there's a lot of chaos going on, but I had a lot of fun with this game and I'd recommend it, even if you're not a fan of the source material. Jack and Battle 2 is also a very good looking game for the system, and its soundtrack is catchy stuff too. Fun fact, the music we keep using in our blooper reels actually comes from this game. Suri implored me to use it since it gave him Benny Hill vibes. <laughs> and it still does! I also really wish Phoebe was playable in its follow-up, One Piece Super Grand Battle X on the 3DS, but she's only a support character in that unfortunately. But we can't ride Karu as a mount here, so that's something. You can't bring up princesses without mentioning Disney. I could look at a movie tie-in game, and I will in a moment. But there are two somewhat original titles I do wish to talk about. Disney Princess Enchanted Journey and Disney Princess My Fairy Tale Adventure. Let's start with Enchanted Journey, developed by Papaya for the PlayStation 2, Wii, and PC. In this game, you play as a young princess, which you name and customize yourself, who's been brought to an abandoned castle by a fairy, as your character is equipped with a magic wand that can save the world of the Disney princesses, which are being ruined by an evil princess named Zara and her underlings called the Bogs. The controls are quite simple, you can fire magic projectiles to attack enemies with. There's also a charge shot which mostly obliterates everything, so you're best off just using that. You can also do a 12 magic which you can use to affect NPCs or the environment. Your character does have a health bar, but you'll barely ever see it since the bugs do so little damage and your character regenerates health very quickly. The game is also sort of a platformer, since you can jump and grab ledges, but there really isn't much platforming to do here. While exploring the different walls, you can collect these gems which... Actually, I don't think these do anything. They all exist to be picked up and to give your brain dopamine as you see the numbers go up. Which made my maxed out counter of 99 of the things feel like nothing by the end of it. I feel so violated. You also have to play some mini games to make progress and... These are harmless, I guess. But it also doesn't help that some are simply reskins of others. I swear you play this catching mini game like 4 or 5 times and by the end of the game you're going to be sick of it. Each world has 3 chapters which all vary in difficulty, but I say difficulty in massive quotes there as the game is incredibly easy altogether. The harder worlds are just longer and more monotonous in all honesty. There's also one more you could play after rolling the credits but it's over before you know it. Pretty underwhelming. Overall this game is… okay. It's only a few hours long and the game isn't difficult in the slightest. You can tell that it was made with very young girls in mind. It also doesn't help your fairy companion like to remind you of your current objective every few minutes or so. Jeez, now he's got nothing on this gal. I can see kids getting some enjoyment out of it, but if you're looking for something with a bit more meat to it, you're not gonna find it here. Let's move on to My Fairy Tale Adventure. This game is pretty much a fault to Uncharted Journey, not in story but in gameplay style. Developed by High Impact Games and Trans Gaming? Who oh, wants some of that? Anyway, this one is available for the Wii, 3DS, and PC. And word of advice, avoid playing the 3DS version. It has a terrible resolution and runs at like 5 frames a week. The story here is you play as another young princess who you name and customize yourself, who accidentally changes the sprites who are tending her garden into troublemaking imps. Now they stole the castle's crystals and are running amok in the other princess's world. So it's up to you and your magic to save them. There's no big bad evil guy in this one. You're just a princess who wants to help others in atone for her mistakes. That's quite refreshing in all honesty. The game controls almost the same as its predecessor. You can still jump and attack with projectile magic and affect the environment with tall magic, though you can't spam projectiles as much as you used to and the charge attack is gone. Which I'm actually fine with, that thing was way too overpowered anyway. There's also these magical jump pads which allow you to leap long distances. And there's still gems to collect, but get this, you can actually buy stuff with gems now. Such as furniture for your room, or new customization options. Finally, a use for these things. Also, after getting the princess crystals back, 
You could open these colored chests using 12 magic. Some pieces of clover can only be found in these by the way. These chests appear in the main stages too, so you'll need to backtrack if you want to open them more- ARE YOU SERIOUS RIGHT NOW?! There's many games you have to play to make progress in this one too. Though I find the ones here to be a lot more varied and enjoyable. My two favourites being the Dancing Rhythm mini game and the one that's pretty much just a Puzzle Bobble clone. And the game does look a bit nicer than its predecessor. Those magical effects are super pretty. The only thing I think this game does worse than Enchanted Journey is that the dialogue isn't lip synced in this one. Maybe that was done to compensate for the game being dubbed in multiple languages? Plus, I think some of the character models aren't as pleasing to look at here. And dear fairy godmother, what did he do to Ursula's jawline? My fairy tale adventure is still only a few hours long, and isn't that challenging or deep, but it's still definitely an improvement over the previous outing. I still wouldn't recommend it if you're looking for something with a bit more lasting appeal, but if you are interested and you can find it for a reasonable price, you're probably better off skipping Enchanted Journey altogether and playing this one instead. I think this game mostly does everything that one does but better. Although Disney Medical World 2 is better than both of those, just saying. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Though, worth of warning if you're planning to play the PC versions of these games through Steam like I am, they have no native control support, meaning you'll have to endure the keyboard controls or use the external application like Joyce to key to remedy this. Also, make sure you turn cloud saving off with My Fairy Tale Adventure because it can actually corrupt your save files. And guess what happened to mine? <laughs> Last but not least, we have Barbie and the Twelve Dancing Princesses, developed by Way Forward and based upon the movie of the same name. There's multiple versions of this thing, but I'll only be looking at the DS version and the GBA version, which I've heard plays exactly the same. I would go over the plot, but there's barely any plot here. I thought I would follow the story of the film, but I guess that would require effort. Just know that you play as Barbie, who's called Guinevere here, who's trying to save the other 11 princesses, and a few other characters from the clutches of Duchess Roanna, who's trying to sabotage everything and take the crown for herself. Wait, I just realized this is a story about a damsel saving other damsels in distress. I can't think of anything to say about that. Barbie and the 12 Dancing Princesses is a mostly standard 2D platformer, and it's also sort of a metroidvania? The only thing you can do at the start is walk and jump, and can only take 3 hits before going down. But by saving the other princesses, you're given new shoes that give Gwenevere new abilities when equipped. This includes using a butterfly net as an attack, walking over gaps, summoning ribbons to reach higher platforms, using a mallet and ball to hit switches, placing a stack of books that can be used as platforms, and moving at a faster speed, which is my personal favourite because of how goofy it looks. You switch between the different abilities using L and R, or by tapping the icons on the touchscreen. Each one also changes the colour of your dress, which is pretty cute, and there are signs everywhere which tell you when a certain ability should be used. The game doesn't exactly have the most graceful level design, I must say, but there were some level gimmicks I did enjoy, like the one with the visible platforms, which were visible on the mirrors in the background. There are also some bonus levels you could play to increase your heart meter, like one where you have to catch a bunch of butterflies in a net, or one where you have to reach the end of the level using a limited amount of book stacks. There are also these extra levels where you play as a kitten, which are all also scrollers, but thankfully this cat is more athletic than your main character is. I don't think you get anything for finishing these, but they're an interesting distraction. There's also the occasional boss fight, and these are… okay. They aren't much of a challenge when you know what the strategy is to defeat them, and same goes for the final boss. It has multiple phases, but it was really more of a test of patience than anything. Honestly, Barbie and the Twelve Dancing Princesses wasn't that bad for a licensed game. It definitely has a ton of issues and I don't think I can recommend it, especially over the other games I covered in this video, but I wouldn't mind seeing another title like it with its ideas refined. Again, just like with those two Disney princess games, you could probably tell it was made with very young girls in mind. Yet here I am, an effeminate cupid in their mid-twenties playing and critiquing this thing. Don't judge me, okay? To be honest, the only reason I decided to give this game a look-see is because I heard around that it wasn't that bad of a license game. It's actually the starting to some people. I also get the feeling that this is probably someone's guilty pleasure game, and I'm not one to judge. I'm the same person who loves Koizuru Purin after all. Okay, we're done with all the main games I wanted to talk about, but before we wrap up completely, there's a few other games I want to give some honorable mentions to. This here is an action RPG called Sudeki, also, sorry for the choppy footage, my recording settings were incorrect and I don't have time to redo it. Anywho, this game has a princess party member you could play as called Ailish, 
and her attacks are mostly projectile based. The interesting thing is that whenever you control her, it's from a first person perspective. A princess FPS, I never thought I'd see one of those. Sudeki is an interesting little game. It's available on the original Xbox and Steam, check it out if it piques your interest. The Dragon Quest series has had its fair share of princess party members. Princessa from 2, Alana from 4, Mad Chen from 5, and Jade from 11. Alana cracks me up because a lot of people say she's very similar to Princess Daisy, since they're both tomboyish and have similar hairstyles. In fact, one time I saw someone draw an alpha swap between the two, and I could barely tell the difference. Michiru Kuda from Prepara, a card based dress up rhythm game series that's mostly on arcades, is apparently a princess. I didn't know she was until doing research for this video. I don't dive much into the lore of these games, but it seems that she is. Okay. If you're playing 2 player in Wonder Boy 3 Monster Lair, this platformer shmup hybrid of sorts, the second player gets to play as Princess Prapril, who I think is related to the other Praprils in the series. And honestly, this is the first thing about Monster Lair for me, other than the TurboGrafx CD version having a phenomenal soundtrack. This game is okay at best. Lastly, I wanted to bring up a few games where you could dress up as a princess. Not exactly playing as royalty, but looking the part. This here is Disney Magical World 2, a Disney themed life of sorts where you can run a cafe, tend the farm, fight ghostly combat sections, and many other things. With the items you've collected, you can create new outfits for yourself, some of which being costumes inspired by certain Disney princesses. The outfits aren't gender locked, by the by. I'm using a male character here and I can still equip them. Oh, and here's the best part. If you decide you want to cross dress while doing a castle ball, your dance partner will get in on it too and wear the opposite counterpart to your outfit. <laughs> this is the best feature of the game for me right here. Dan Rare made a detailed review of this figure a little while back, so check that out if you're interested and want more deets. This here is a Japan only DS game called Mina no Suizo Kukan, or Everyone's Aquarium in English. The best way I can describe this title is, imagine a game where you're playing as a kid working at a sea park and you play Cooking Mama style mini games to look after it. That's pretty much how it plays. Anyway, you're awarded stamps for performing tasks, and with enough stamp sheets collected, you can exchange them for costumes, one of which being this adorable princess outfit if you're playing as a girl. It's definitely my favourite of the bunch. There's also a mermaid outfit you could buy after finishing the game. How does that one work? Finally, you're all probably wondering about my current getup. Well, this is a recreation of the Dreaming Princess chord from the Aikatsu series, Aikatsu Stars specifically. Dress up rhythm games that are also card based, similar to Prepara, and have only been released in Japan as far as I'm aware. This Prima Rare set is also the signature outfit of one of the characters, Hime Shiratori. I mean, it makes sense. Her name is Hime, that's literally Japanese for princess. And there we have it. A boatload of games where you could play as princesses. I may have bit enough more than I could chew making this, but I think it was all worth it in the end. Out of all of these, my absolute favourites were Super Mario 3D World. Again, I think this 3D platform is super well made, and it might be the game that was responsible for me making this video in the first place. Mario plus Rabbit Sparks of Hope, an incredible sequel and a fantastic tactical RPG in its own right, with tons of charm to boot. Super Mario Bros. Wonder, Definitely the best 2D Mario game we've gotten in years, even if the boss fights are a bit on the underwhelming side. Cadence of Hyrule, a really fun rhythm based roguelike with top notch pixel art, a bumping soundtrack and tons of content, especially with the Season Pass DLC. Dead Sense of No Starfy 3, still the best Starfy game in my opinion, and it's not just because this marine platform was the first one with Starly or has a cameo appearance from Wario. Ruin Factory 4 Special, a game I've spent countless hours on, and counting. In fact, I kind of didn't want to stop playing it as I was getting footage. Final Fantasy IX, my personal favourite in the series, full of charming characters, great gameplay, plus a unique ability system. And Chrono Trigger, the cult classic Squaresoft RPG that still stands the test of time. Pun totally intended. And even with all the honourable mentions I gave, I think I'm only barely scratching the surface on this topic, according to the research I did, but I don't want this video to go on forever and I am limited to what's available to me. And we're still getting more princess games. There's that new Pierce title on the way. And believe it or not, there's a spiritual successor to those Zelda CDI games coming out, where you play as a princess called RZ, and it actually looks fun. So before I take off, I ask lovely mortals, 
What are your favourite titles where you could play as princesses? Are there any I missed? Let me know in the comments, because as long as there's princess games to play, I'll always be ready to bend the knee and embrace them. And you have to do what they toss together a bunch of rupees in order to... Rupees? Oh jeez, we're not, we're not selling yet. This, this game is also notable for being... This game is also notable... <laughs> this game is also notable for... This game is also notable for... Come on! Come on, Sue Red! You could do this! Think about what Angie would do.